take Labour that one. <laughs> Job <laughs> taken. <yeah. laughs> but I'm wondering, you know, if you guys, if this is a career you started with right away, or did you have a different job before you got into this field? I suppose I'll go first. Um, welcome everybody. I think we blame the Sam for remembering the other part of the crowd back there. But um, I got into it about 25, 25, 26 years ago. My background is all engineering, uh, fitting, turning to a making. Um, five years in the military in Ireland, so we just had border patrols. They're exciting. <laughs> um, so when I, I fell into the, basically through the back door of my world, I, I basically just threw people, threw friends of mine in the engineering and I had one of the guys with an electrician and his two brothers did special effects. But with Brendan is one of these characters, and I'm sure we all have them, that you never believe a word out of him out because he just tends to prolong everything and extend everything and he's the best at everything. But he did have two brothers in the film industry in the special effects. Um, so I got in through knowing friends where they needed extra people. Um, on Brave Pardon, I started off in special effects. I jumped over then to Armory. And, um, I found it quite easy. I found it very enjoyable. And that was on, was on Braveheart. And uh, we were in, in Ireland for five months. Scotland for the first month and a half, and then, and then Ireland for five months shooting. So my introduction and my entry into the film world was just purely by accident. It's not something that I studied for. It's not something that I, that I wanted to be involved with. I love my engineering. It just happened that the, the factory or the place I was in was shutting down and everybody moves on. So that's my entry into it. Paula? Uh, so I uh, went to school. I have a uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts and my uh, major was actually photography and a minor in art history. And, um, but one of my summer jobs, I'm, I'm from Canada, and one of my summer jobs was an, as an apprentice to a picture and sound editor at the National Film Board. And I, my job at that time, we were still working on mag stock, so I sat, <clears throat> my job was to sit and well, uh, Les Hallman, who was my mentor, I guess, at the time, because he really was the person who kind of turned the light bulb on for me. Uh, I would sit, he would cut these sounds on mag, uh, and then pass them to me, and I'd cut them into tracks and make cue sheets. So I just sat and watched him work. And there was a, a really interesting movie, um, well, it was this documentary on humpback whales that he was doing. And what had happened was that, um, so they were shooting off, off the coast of Nova Scotia, which is where I, I grew up. And um, uh, the crew was out one day, and the, and the whales decided to have some fun. And they flipped the boat that the crew was in. They were in a small, like a dinghy or a fishing boat or whatever. They flipped the boat, and the whole crew and all the gear went overboard. Um, so what that meant was to, in continuing on with the shoot, they shot then you know, from a larger boat, and it meant a lot of telephoto stuff and the inability to get up close for sound. So when it came to the um, cutting room, you know, uh, the sound had to be created. And I watched this man very painstakingly and lovingly uh, take uh, a series of water lap, um, water lap sounds from uh, one of the early libraries, sound effect libraries that had come in. Uh, it was the Sound Ideas libraries from the 1000 series. It was literally the, the very beginnings of these sound effect libraries. And he cut the, um, each and every lap up against the whale's body. It was, it was incredible. And they went on to win, you know, best sound for that, that film. And, you know, the recordist on it did a great job as much as he could, you know, given the circumstances. But what I watched was the power of, of creating the illusion of being up close to the whale. And, it, and, and this light bulb went on in my head, and I was like, oh my god. You know, it was, you know, I suddenly realized it was like the portal opened. <laughs> and I was transported to the alien Earth ship. Um, uh, but no, it was, it was like this aha moment that, that sent me off on this journey. And I was, you know, I was a, a, a practicing artist 
I continued to work for many years in the art community. I ran um, uh, with a couple of colleagues a, uh, an artist center, media art center in Canada, um, still exi in existence, Charles Street Video, um, and um, you know worked with other artists. I was, you know, did picture editing and sound editing in crude. You know, we provided very top end. Uh, <coughs> facilities to artists um, at that time it was like beta cam sp you know and in the commercial world it was like five hundred dollars an hour for artists it was twenty five dollars an hour because we were highly subsidized and we all created for each other and so my own work as an artist started to have more and more of a kind of a sound component i started to explore and as arts funding started to dry up i decided to go and, and pursue another job and i had had a grant um, to make a, a short film, which I did, and I taught myself uh, Pro Tools that year, and uh, happened to wander into a facility called Sound Dogs in Toronto. Again, they, you may have heard them recently. They were nominated for the Oscar First Shape of Water, so those are my peeps. And uh, I happened to walk in when they had just lost their effects person. They took a chance on this crazy girl from the art, you know, community who had no training whatsoever, uh, and I, you know, and so my journey began. And I worked there for a few years, and then eventually wandered my way down to LA to kind of jump into the middle of the insanity. There's a lot of <laughs> insanity, and uh, you have to navigate in order to stay in the business as long as you have. You guys both speak about your work specifically, and. All, Game of Thrones specifically with such passion, but was there ever a time before now where you're like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? I don't want to do this anymore. Or have you just been gung-ho, yes, this is it, this is the right path? Good question. Uh, I, think, I think every job that you take on obviously depends on, on, on that sort of realm, whether it's, a, it's an enjoyable job or it's a tough, um, a tough number where you're dealing with big crowds. My end of it is I do firearms as well, so it's not just swords and sandals as I call it. Um, I do all the firearms, the, the Private Ryans, the Black Hawk Downs, the Band of Brothers. So all of these ones are on my jobs as well. So really, my war depends on how enjoyable the set is. And it's not so much the action, I don't deal with, with, the, with looking at the action in my war. So I just look at going, is this going to be fun? Because we know what we can do, I know what I can do, I know what my team, because I employ them, so I know what they can do. So it's not so much where I worry too much about the, the job itself, I'm, more hope, I'm hoping that it's a, it's a good environment, it's an enjoyable job, the director's nice, the first is nice, the second is nice, the producers are nice. Because in my world, if they're not nice, then I'm dealing with not nice people, so I'll be polite about it. So that makes... That, that makes it a bit more difficult. So as long as I'm dealing with nice people, I don't care about the action, I don't care about how difficult to make and keep up with the job is. I just try to have a nice environment and, um, and enjoy the experience. So that's the way I look at it, because I know everybody has to do the same thing. It doesn't matter if it's me or the next person. Um, guys or girls, it doesn't matter. My job, we have the same in it, and everybody's equal. So my world is making sure that it's enjoyable. We know it's going to be tough. We know we have X amount of people that are going to be trying to kill each other. But, you know, is there a party later on tonight? Is there a bit of crack later? That's my world. <laughs> no, when I say crack, that's Irish crack now. <laughs> What, what is Irish crack? I thought we were doing like a huge... Fun, not, oh, fun. All right. Not the program. Crack is fun. I was like, wow, it's a big information bomb dropped. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah, Joanna says, hold my beer. It's going into vanity food. Yeah, yeah. But crack, it's fine. It's fine. All right. Uh, Paula, is there ever a time where you're just like, this is... No, I don't want to. You know, that's a very loaded question to ask a woman in the industry, is it not? <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, no, it's, um, for me, it's, you know, my trajectory and my path has been a long, windy, and often very bumpy kind of road. And, um, you know, I start from a place of loving what I do unconditionally and being impassioned to do that no matter what comes up for me. And many things, many obstacles have come up along the way 
you know, being a woman in the industry, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, they did a statistic for sound designers, and they're still to this day, at the end of 2017, only 5% of sound designers are women. So what happened when I, you know, I moved to LA in 1998, and in Canada, it's a different thing. It wasn't so unusual for a woman to be a sound supervisor or to work in effects. But this when I arrived in the States, in Hollywood, it was a completely different thing. And I actually didn't anticipate it. It was a little bit of a shock to my system. And I had made this big move. I had switched countries, you know. And it was difficult. It was difficult. Um, I, first of all, when I moved to the States, um, I had moved with, I had done 35 features and about 60 hours of TV, and none of it counted um, for my union hours in the States. So I had to start from scratch, like I was a 17-year-old, which I was not. And um, I, I watched my male colleagues have the back door open to them, and they got to bypass stuff like that. You know, so that was the first thing I saw. And um, I also found the studios to be highly uncomfortable for a woman and for a creative soul. You know, they're very corporate and a very uncomfortable place for women. And especially when you're only the only woman, you know, I felt alone. Uh, you know, the practice of making people work late into the night and you having to walk a dark uh, walk along an empty set to a horribly dark parking garage. I remember that was one of my experiences on. Sony Live, it was creepy as shit for me, and I, I didn't like it. It, it. it sucked my soul and, and made me hate my job, and, you know, and I loved what I did. So I stopped doing that, and I started to turn down jobs where they wouldn't allow me to work for my own space. And luckily, I, I um, <clears throat> you know, I, I have always been very technically interested in my work, my dad was a, an electronic engineer and used to build TV sets at home and I used to sit next to him as a little girl and pretend I was helping. So I had a, like a fearlessness of technology and a wonderment about the possibilities of using it. So I have literally built every studio that I have had during the course of my career and I've had many um, and have always worked for my own space. And I basically started to back away from the that kind of space, um, for better, for worse. I think that that created some problems in my world. But the other thing I did was I, I, I wanted to be a sound designer. Now in those days, sound designer, the term was not really in existence. It was more sound supervising. And um, so, uh, and, and sound effects work. And, but I couldn't get hired on, you know, much, uh, much of the interesting stuff that I had moved there for. So I started to learn to supervise. And at that time, I know it may come as a shock to anyone who has seen me on some of these panels, but I literally lived my 20s as an almost mute. I was very shy, couldn't speak, and I realized that I had to learn to talk and to communicate and get, and get in to put myself in that position if I was going to work. And so I started taking on supervising of small projects, small films, and then hiring myself as the sound designer and learning my chops. Good hire, Paula. Right? Yeah. I was very loyal to myself. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, but it was, you know, again, I mean, it's like think outside the box. What can you do, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I've had many. I, I've had times this year when I wonder what the hell I'm doing, you know? It's like, because I've transitioned from being someone who has no profile, you know, is working away and whatever to, you know, and, and have dealt with discrimination, being passed over no matter how hard I worked, to now I'm a woman aging in Hollywood. And that's something that has been freaking me out. It's a new thing that I have been feeling and women are, are retired to the farm much faster than men and it is freaking me out. I mean, it is something that I think about on a daily basis. And so because of that, I'm trying to now create my own opportunity again. It's like, you know, if you're not invited to the parade, make your own parade. You know, it's like, so that's... Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, for both of you, you, you have a lot of, you, know, you work from home, Tom, you have a team, you have a lot of control, uh, or some measure of control in your given field. But what has, 
being on Game of Thrones done for the kind of work that is coming your way? I know Tommy has been pretty busy on Game of Thrones, but are there other movies that are just like, hey, hey, you're the Game of Thrones guy, go on drugs. That's a, that's a funny one. Like, uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, I'm, what, nine years on this, so I started from the pilot, I was on the now that haven't sacked me so far, so maybe after Monday when he got back, I'll sack me. <laughs> but anyway, everything's made, so it won't matter. So uh, I have never got a job off the back of this because I think it's only like yourselves that really care. In, in the industry, I mean, obviously, I'm from Europe, I'm from, our, from Ireland, a small town just below Dublin, Wicklow, and um, lovely place. We've done a lot of great movies there. Um, picturesque, but nobody gives a shit who you are. Nobody cares. I and mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, I've got mates who still won't come up. Oh, I'm not going to Belfast. Nah, I don't want to. So it's one of those things, and I look at it going, how many jobs I've got from Game of Thrones? Zilch. None whatsoever. But that doesn't bother me because I, I'm already 25 in the industry. And I've had some people come through the armory because I always have a display case and the weapons are all in and everything's displayed as nice as and I try to keep the workshop, even though it's a practical workshop. Um, I keep it very nice, very clean. That's just the way I am. I, like, I'm very I saw it too and I can attest it is absolutely spectacular. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, John. <laughs> Give me the money later. <laughs> so, in my world, um, I'm not to say much controlling, I'm very, very not controlling, but at the same time I have to control my pattern, my equipment, my feel, my look, for what I have to produce. But um, I've had people coming in and I had one producer at one time, they brought a load of people in and they're all directors and everything else and they're so chuffed about Game of Thrones. And of course I'm a bit of a smart arse, so, which is <laughs> my personality. So he comes in, the first thing he says, and highfalutin, is this the best job you've ever been on? And that was the worst question to ask really, because I said, well, not really, no. <laughs> so he's in shock, they're in shock, and I go, Braveheart's my best job I was ever on. Is this the longest one? I said, because obviously I've been sacked, and I just walk away. And feel, so he shows everybody around the weapon room. So it's like, you're left that little limbo. But I, I keep myself well grounded. I keep myself well grounded in the industry because I know it's fickle, and it is fickle. You're a flavor, you're a flavor of the moment, not even a flavor of the month. So I'm fully aware. As I'm sure Duane is the same. That we're fully aware that you're only as good as, in my world, the last weapon I've made. Boys don't like it. I'm in trouble, and they'll hear about it, or I'll hear about it from the boys. So it's one of those things where. You have to keep pushing the barrier, keep pushing the envelope, and keep pushing, keep pushing, and try to keep create nice, nice items. But it's the very, very same as um, firearms when I do, you know, proper war movies or whatever. I mean, in my next adventures, there's a Jack Ryan, and I've got a, a Michael Bay one as well. They'll be exciting, they'll be crazy, they'll be pure madness. But again, you have to make sure you push yourself, push yourself. Um, but going back to the question, do I get any work from Game of Thrones? No, nobody's ever rang me up to say, listen, you are who you are, we'd love you to do this job. Um, true producers, true first assistants, true um, directors is where I've got my work. So it's people, it's friends that I make, it's people that I know in the industry and that you become friends with. So you're not just, you know, in my case here, the weapons master, I am a human being. I, I try to be nice to people, I'm very hospitable, very courteous much as they can be. But if you cross me, that's a different that's a different lion. I'll cut you in half. <laughs> that's just the way it is. But that's, that. but that's me. And I'm sure a lot of people would be similar. But again, I make friends and I try to incorporate people into my world. And we just and that's the way it is. My world is just people bringing me up. I mean, my next two jobs, one is from a producer and one is from a very good friend in, in Paris who has a job and needs me to give him a hand. And we, we bounce off each other. If I have too much work on, I throw it his way, he throws it my way, you throw it around so everybody can get a little bit of a bite out of it. Otherwise, I'm trying to take four jobs on at a time and then put people in that are you know, incapable of doing it, but can do it, but not to my standard that I require. So, have I got much work off Game of Thrones? No. But that doesn't bother me because I get nine months of the year to ten months of the year, every year for the last eight years on Thrones, and then I fill the gaps in between 
helping out other jobs or doing other jobs also. It's all crossover. How are you, Paul? Yeah, no, same. I mean, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, first of all, there's the impression that I work on Game of Thrones all year round. You know, I'm not on the set. And in fact, I'm probably the last person to be brought on, even on the sound crew, because my work is tied to visual effects. And the visual effects are very, as you know, very intricate, take a long time, and until they are sort of to a certain point, still in very rough form, but they, they wait till that point to bring me on. Um, so there's, first of all, an assumption, there's also, I think, people think that everyone who works on Game of Thrones has a piece of Game of Thrones, that so we're like, super rich and don't need to work. <laughs> God, I wish. But, uh, um, so yeah, so it's kind of saying, it's like, um, you know. Who, who you know. Well, it's sort of, you meet people along the way, right? I mean, you know, you work, uh, you know, I also was, uh, did some work on Jack Ryan and, you know, one of, one of the producers is, you know, someone I've worked with since Lost, you know, we've kept in contact, we've worked on stuff over the years, back and forth, whatever, and, you know, and it, it goes the same, every once in a while I'll get called for something. There's, there's the odd time, it's like, you know, sometimes younger filmmakers will approach because of the work, you know, especially if there's some kind of like weird ass thing they need and they know that I'll go there. Um, but those jobs often don't pay anything and I do, you know, and I do probably to my detriment have been trying to help out and, and nurture new filmmakers and new voices, especially women directors, for instance. Um, but again, those are, those don't come along very often. But yeah, it's, it's really, you know, and you were saying, you know, you're only as good as your last weapon. It's the same for me. You know, not my weapon, but my weapon. You're, 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 on Dead Dragon's Creek. I am Dead Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Which apparently is not a weapon, as we learned last night. <laughs> in, uh, in the right. So, um, <laughs> so, no, it's like you keep, so, so it's a contest with yourself to always up your game, to always be better, and that, you know, that feeds your soul, that keeps you fresh. You know, and then you hope that you meet people along the way that you want to collaborate with. My, my work is very intimate in some ways and very collaborative, so it's, it's I need, I, I'm not interested in working with assholes anymore. You know, I did that time. You know, when you're starting out, you got to take every job. You got to, you know, and, and sometimes, and I still have, you know, done stuff recently with people that maybe I didn't love. But I always find something in it for me that I love so that I can keep engaged and not, because if you start to get bitter, um, then your work starts to suffer and then you're judged on the work that you produce and that's a problem, you know? And it, you can't go, yeah, but that guy was, you know, an asshole. You know, nobody cares, you know? It's, they only see the work and think, wow, oh, I've worked with him, you know? And, and you know, and I, I you know, my job, my, 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 my desire is to always do the best that I can do to explore new regions and to, you know, I, I want to learn on every show that I work on, you know, whatever it is, whether I'm researching something or whether I'm uh, exploring someone's, you know, crazy imaginary world, you know, I learn from that and, and I'm hungry for that all the time. So I'm now, you know, I gravitate towards projects with, with tour visionary people uh, who like to wander in imaginary landscapes too? You know, it's my that is my passion. Now, Tommy mentioned the, um, the boys, um, boys and Benny off. Did you hear from them if they're not happy with something that you've done? Um, I'm curious if there's one thing that you really wanted, whether a weapon or a sound, that really wanted to make it into the show that didn't make it. The the sword that might have been, or the sound that might have been, from one of you. I think on my end of it, no. Um, I've been quite lucky that they've uh, they've liked what I've created. Um, and plus, they like to, they have to have their input. You know, the, the, the boys with Dave and Dan, they they'll have their their, their little say. would we'll speak prior to the shoot. And if they have something that they want to or, or a weapon to develop in that way, then hint to us within their script, or they'll tell me, you know, point blank, we want to go this way with this kind of weapon. Look, at make it look like. Know, something like this, or a samurai-ish, but not obviously samurai. So it's the one of those things where 
yeah, they give you a little bit of creation. But in fairness, I've been very, very lucky with, 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 with other jobs, and I've done a lot of these kind of ones with, you know, with Gladiator and Kingdom of Heaven and stuff like that. And it's taken out of your hands because you'll have an art director or designer that will want control of everything, color tones, look styles, and they'll nearly give you a look of a weapon that they want themselves. Um, so I'm very lucky on this end of it on, on drones is that once I close my doors, nobody comes in and it's great. And it's simple, <laughs> so you just get, I want your work. If they don't like it, I mean, at the same time, it's not so much that I just, you know, but I make it and you say, listen, you take it or leave it. It's never like that. So I know what they want. I, I'm, I'm not an idiot, so I can, I can see exactly where style needs to be, the, the vision, the look, the style, you know, to suit the character, to suit the house, and or whether it be opulent or whether it be downtrodden. So you try and make it in that tone. Same as the leather work, the, the, the leather work and the, and the, and the colour toning and all of that kind of stuff. So every the weaponry is totally down to myself and my team. And again, which I haven't said a lot of, my team is very important because you know, I'm, I'm only one person, like physically can't create every, you know, four, five hundred, six hundred items, you know, and so lead alone is like four hundred sets of spears, shields, daggers, I mean, that's not a lot of work, you know, for people. So you have to make sure that people around you are able to put their input in and make and make and make, and we all keep our head down. But I'm, I've been very lucky um, regarding my mates that I've had none of them turn back. Some of them they might say, I mean, Aria Holt, for example, you know, say we want, the, the script said, Aria Holt steps forward with a big axe. I mean, what does that mean, you know? <laughs> what? I mean, that's not much of a help. So, you know, you can say it's a halberd, you can say it's a pole arm, you can say whatever it is. It's probably more than, it's really an axe, you know, less than an axe. But I knew in the world that we needed to be, to make it very opulent unusual shape, plenty of gold, plenty of filigree because it was a door. So I knew exactly where I wanted to go with it. And I, I know what I have in my material, in my, in my metal work, in my, in my penis, and my materials to see where I want to go with this and how I can create something. And then I have all my machines there, my, my, my milling machines, and turning my CNC's, my cylindrical grinder, you name it, it's all in my workshop so we can create and make everything physically as well. So everything is done uh, in the workshop. So I can always slightly adapt if need be, but um, I've been looking, I haven't created anything that hasn't been used, and I don't have any secret ones in there either, that haven't been used. <laughs> Paula? Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting to hear that, because it's the same, I, I would say the same for me, you know, I think that comes partially to, you know, I've talked a bit about this before, that, that just the way Dan and David work, you know, they give us, I mean, once you kind of, show that you're part of the team and what you can do. I think, you know, when I came on in season three, you know, I, I you know, your question until you show them your work and then that gives, you know, sussing out some stuff in season three and, and after that, I mean, my God, they have just let me, it's the same, you know, I have a studio, you know, I work alone. I don't, you know, nobody comes in and tells me, but I will create stuff, uh, do s audio sketches, I will send them, if I'm not sure about something, I will send them, um, uh, you know, a kind of uh, concept sketch of things, or sometimes, sometimes not if there's no time, because for sound, unfortunately, we're the last stop on the choo-choo train, so it's like out of time, out of money, uh, always, <laughs> and even on something like Thrones, I mean, it's a very compressed schedule, there's not a lot of time. But, you know, I remember with the Blue Fire, for instance, when I saw that first shot, I was like, oh my God. And I contacted them, I said, so what are you thinking? And they said, you know, like, what are you thinking about the sound and stuff for this? And they said, honestly, they had not thought about it. <laughs> Which was an interesting thing because, you know, so it's like, okay. And what I, you know, one of the scary things about that was that I, I was thinking, you know, not only did I want to make it something really unusual and amazing for that scene, but, <clears throat> I was thinking ahead, uh, which is something that we all have to do in Game of Thrones because, you know, the story keeps evolving and moving and changing, and I was thinking ahead to the final season to my scariest thought of what could possibly happen, which would be a battle between a real dragon and an ice dragon, and if you have that, the 
of the blue fire and the, and the orange fire have to sound differently? And how could those two exist in the same sonic space that you could differentiate? So I started to think about that, which made me even more scared, uh, but wanted to come up with something extremely unique, but that was kind of believable for what you were seeing. Yeah. Um, and when I pitched them the concept for it, which was way out in the stratosphere, you know what, their, their, their reaction was, hey, you know, go for it, try it, you know, which was, it's fantastic. They didn't say, oh yeah, but, or whatever. They don't attach any limitations in some way. They allow us to roam. Because I think that they realize, it's like everybody on this show is on their A game. We've been in this industry for long periods of time. We've seen much. We have databases of, you know, you have databases of imagery of weapons in your brain. I have databases of endless sounds. And so, you know, I can pick and choose from all of that and combine them in different ways and whatnot. And they trust that process and they allow us to do it. And they're excited, I think, for what we present to them because they can come up with an idea, we take and run with it, and then come back with the, you know, you know what, you know, our kind of uh, things that we create and find and, and, and imagine. And I think they get excited by that process because as long as it is in line with the emotional conceptual core of what they're trying to say in a scene or do in the scene, I think that they're on board and if their minds are open, and they're endlessly curious to see what we will, how we will help them tell their story. And it's, it is a, a remarkably beautiful, uh, unique event, but I, I've said that because of how they do this with us, that is why Thrones is Thrones, you know? It exists like that because everybody in every department, I, I bet, has the exact same experience and is allowed to do the same, so you come up with a much richer palette much richer experience because we are all doing kind of the same sort of deal. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, we are going to open uh, the uh, in up for questions from the audience in just one second. I have one more question, but if we want, oh, the mic I suppose is right there. I don't know if we want to get in a better position or just leave it there. Thank you, Dave. Um, but the uh, my last question for you is um, I'm going to try to draw inspiration from George R. R. Martin and make you um, make a terrible choice that will hurt you, which is, uh, <laughs> say, say there's an awful fire and you're gonna lose every single piece of equipment and tool and whatever that you've amassed over the years. What's the one tool, the one thing you save from your arsenal? <laughs> Sorry, it's Game of Thrones. <laughs> the most vital tool in your arsenal. I think of myself, I've been myself and my team. The rest I can do, it's no drama. Yourself and your team, Paula. I mean, I'm just, you are safe no matter what. It's not you, but your team, your team is your, is your tool. My one would, would be with my team. Your team. Because, um, you know, in my world is such a, you have that people around you that will believe what you do and do it to a certain degree and are well capable of and keep their heads down and get on with it basically. There's a lot of, there's a lot we have to put up with. Um, in general, and time frames and schedules, and my guys, which it's guys and girls, but guys means everybody, um, both do it to the nth degree. Huh? Um, it would be my library, you know. I mean, I've been collecting sounds, recording sounds, making sounds for, you know, 25 years. Uh, and I freak out about that. I, my house is sitting right on top of the San Andreas Fault. And I've said many times, you know, if the big one comes, just open up and swallow me whole. <laughs> because it would be very difficult to recover from that. And I have, I'm not in a good place right now. With, I had for years been maintaining, I, I mean, I literally for a while was shipping a backup library to a film vault in Toronto, and I would round robin it. Um, my library has gotten very large. I've been reconsolidating. I've changed it and done a bunch of stuff and transferred it and whatnot. And I'm in this very precarious spot right now. That if there was a disaster, I'd be screwed royally. So this has been darker than I expected. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> like a fire and death. And Tommy's like, save the people that matter to me, of course. And Paul is like, I'm on a fault. How could you? <laughs> so, um, sorry about that. 
Um, Dave, do you have any crack-related questions? Uh, no, no crack-related questions. But since you guys both work uh, creating both uh, historically accurate weapons or real sounds, and then also the fantasy version, is there one of those that you appreciate doing more? Is it like back to my bread and butter of making stuff up, or back to my bread and butter of knowing what this sounds like or looks like accurately? Probably on my end of it, um, I don't mind either way. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm versed with making either something that's historically right, or you get the White Walkers or Dragon Glass. You know, it is what it is, it's fantasy to a certain degree, but it's still a physical item, so you can still physically see it and use it. It doesn't exist, you know, that's time to tell. But um, on my end of it, it's just making, creating is fine. I, I thought this would distinguish between any of them. Oh, for me, definitely, I, I love to wander in the fantastical. It's the most fun, you know. My favorite, my favorite genre is fantastical allegory, which is, you know, Game of Thrones definitely fits into that. There are lots of other kinds of genres, of, you know, lots of other projects that fit into that as well. But, you know, it's funny, for years, I, I had done a lot of bread and butter. You know, I was known for doing guns and cars for a while and stuff, and it's like, I have less and less interest in... I, I guess I'm just dis I'm disconnecting from reality. <laughs> <laughs> all dragons all the time. Thank all you, dragons all the time. <laughs> Meg, yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to know, as far as uh, weapons go, what was one of the more uh, challenging builds? Uh, whether it was on scale, like the uh, uh, dragon shooter and the cart, or whether it was just challenging to design. And then, as far as sounds, kind of the same thing. I know you talked a little bit about the dragons and having to think ahead, but was there a particular scene that was extremely challenging for mixing sound? Good question. Um, mine was probably the White Walker sword, only because it was a time frame. It wasn't the fact that I didn't know where I wanted to go with it, I did, but it was the fact that it was taken out of our hands and it was originally supposed to be visual effects, so it was never going to be made as a physical item. It was always going to be a, you know, a green bar, a green stick, and they could pull whatever they wanted then after a while. And that's fine. And it saves me doing one more item. So it was, I'm thinking about happy days, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> but then that backfired with a meeting that I had with, we had a, one of our 600,000 meetings. That's our, <laughs> drive me mad. But anyway, I suppose that had to happen. And then I was suddenly told three weeks out of shoes, three weeks out of time that we have to, oh, by the way, Tom, you're making it. I said, what do you mean I'm making it? I said, well, you can't afford special effects. You're cheaper. I said, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to get on and make it. And then that was the hardest part. But you go, know, oh, my God. Now, you know, I knew what I wanted. I knew I had shards of, of ice before. And they were never, they used to be even on, on um, old Superman and stuff like that. And I'd seen all the shards. You know, I like that. I like that. Idea. And I always had it in my toolbox. I don't know why. I always had it in my toolbox. And um, it's one of the means to pull it out and ah. There it is. So I knew where I wanted to go. I wanted to see the image again, going, yeah, that's, that's, that's the style I want on that. The image of shards of ice. But the problem was with the material. So it was very, very hard to find the, the translucent um, polyurinated carbon, which is what it was, with an armature into it. Suddenly you had, there was like, it was like baking, I don't know who's one of your characters are here that does all baking shows. But it turned into one of those, made the item, poured the material, then we had to bake for three days at a certain temperature, 180 or something for three days. I'm thinking, are you joking? So we had to make three of these, hoping that one would survive. So we made three of them, baked a lot of them. Two survived, one went very dark for some reason. Maybe the catalyst started not the material we used didn't mix properly. So I know I had two out. Problem was, we had three white walkers. I'm thinking, oh my God, what do we do here? So we just had to try and snow up the other one a bit more than we snowed up the first one. So it was like, <laughs> we just dark, we just brightened up with a bit of snow, uh, snow spray. So um, that solved that issue. So we made three of them just in time. That, virtually that day, they were finished and totally shaped up and, and ready to rock and roll. But um, yeah, that was the most hairy one, only because we were thrown into it on the, on the 11th hour. And the material was just about there, just about there. Your most challenging sound. <laughs> I, I would say it's it's the sound that's coming next. You know, it's like uh, you know. I think this season, 
you know, the ice driving was, and the blue fire and stuff was by far the most challenging thing I had to come up with because I had to take the dragon's sounds and then transform them into this ice creature. Um, you know, the, the dragon moved, the Syrian moved from, from the realm of the living to the realm of the dead, moved into my other sort of category of the white sound. And I had to kind of uh, do that. And it was, um, you know, it was, it was scary and daunting. And also, like I said, you know, I'm anticipating always, you know, what's coming next because I don't, didn't want to get backed into a corner for like because I you know unlike Tommy who knows everything about this season I know nothing about this season <laughs> and I but I in my mind you know I'm freaking out thinking about all the possibilities that could happen so I tried to set up threads for next year that would allow me to then pick up and 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 continue on and so you know that and the other the other real challenge was the dragons growing up over the years which was something that wasn't anything I don't think that anyone anticipated, including myself, until it started to happen and I was in the middle of it. I'm trying to, you know, have these creatures who, you know, they're like your, they're like, I mean, I think for all of us who watch the show, it's like having puppies in the house that are growing up with us and you, know, you watch them interact and you watch them grow together and, and you know, maintaining the sense of personality and voice with each one, but, you know, growing them from this big to the size of, you know, 747s and, and it's still maintaining their voice throughout. And it, it, that one luckily snuck up on me over the years, but it, it was, um, you know, each time, each year I saw the new, you know, incarnation of the dragons each season as they grew and grew and grew, uh, the beginning of the season, I was like, oh my God. You know, but, yeah. and for this season, you know, they went from, you know, they went from kind of, you know, van size to airplane size, and it was a gigantic jump, and it was a lot of work because I had to re-engineer the wings, and I had to re-engineer, you know, some of the vocals, and then the transition finally from the Syrian from the living to the dead was crazy, crazy sauce. So. So it's, I mean, it's not safe to ask Tony questions about season eight since he knows everything. But, uh, Paula, since you know nothing, allegedly, um, <laughs> that's your story. What? Um, with a, you know, without spoiling anything, what's the craziest scenario that you anticipate? You're like, oh, what, what could come in season eight that would be so crazy and I would have to do a sound for it? Like, what? Nightmare or dream scenario have you cooked up first? Well, it's the battle of the two dragons. The battle that, of the that freaks me out because you've got to have them in the same song space. You know, and they're loud and they're big, and the fire sound, the sound of fire is very broad sonically. You know, so with the blue fire, I've talked a little bit about the construction, but they have, um, it has a number of elements, including the wonderful screams of. Sam and um, and company yeah, and um, I think, yeah. part of it and also I added um, another piece to it was these and it's funny how it's lived it's I can even hear it on YouTube videos it's uh, I wanted something icy really icy for it and uh, you know my obsession with you know sonic anomalies of the world led me to uh, singing Christ singing courts. Um, it actually exists in the world. It's used in um, shamanistic healing for transcendence, actually. And the quartz itself is mined out of, um, you know, caves in South America, and they it rings off in a very high frequency. And the it is it is uh, believed that the tone of it is a, uh, a harmonic variation on um, the the earth tone of Om. So it's, I love that because it was a really interesting to add another kind of layer to mythology, but the other thing about it was that this sort of crystal ring off, you can hear it, you know, um, when the fire is coming out and it, and it lives even through all the craziness of the wall falling down and the, you know, stuff. So I love that element of it because I know that, you know, there will be the battle of two dragons and some gigantic music also. I can imagine that scenario. It's like, how the hell 
is all that stuff going to get through? And so, um, you know, picking different kinds of frequencies that can live is something that um, you know I thought a lot about. And uh, um, but that that is, you know, that's a scary scenario. And I can tell you that um, as scary in my mind as it is, I know it will be much much worse. <laughs> It'll be great. Um, we are almost out of time. We're pretty much out of time, but I just I feel bad that I bogarted the last question. So you have a quick question and some quick answers. Maybe we can squeeze one more in. Oh, so this might come as a shock, but I have a driving related question <laughs> uh, for Paula. So the noise before um, any dragon makes that <laughs> um, where did you get the inspiration for that? Because the first time I heard it, and every time I hear it since, like a shiver goes up my spine. It's just so awesome. Where did you, get you know what? Question? That's not me. Oh. That is Ramin. Oh. Ramin, the composer, okay, so when that, first, that sound first appeared, is in the plaza scene, right? Remember when she looks like she's giving him away, and then, you know, he's talking shit about her, and mm -hmm. then she says Dracarys for the first time. And Ramin came up with this sound that is, I'm not even sure to this day what it is, but it's some kind of, I think it's some fluttering, know, wind instrument or something like that. And it was incredible. And you know what? It, you don't mess with perfection. It's like, I heard it and it's like, you know, it is absolutely, I mean, it's weird because if you think about it, it almost doesn't, it sounds almost like a dragon can make it, but not quite, but it's so magnificent and it, it, it um, it's like a power up, you know? And uh, <laughs> so it has stuck. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. So that is not, I, I take no credit for all right. Well, I'm so sorry we are out of time. Thank you guys so much. Can you give a round of applause? <laughs> All